This evening, we'll be taking a look at my round 8 game I played earlier today. The game started 10 hours ago. I was playing against a pretty strong junior from Canada. Um, I'll try and pronounce the name, Olivier Kenta Chikurate. I was black. And just because of the tournament standings, I was, um, I mean, I was clearly playing for a win. Um, and I did manage to win. Apologies for the spoiler. But it, it put me in, uh, or puts me in good, good standing going into tomorrow. Yeah, the game was actually pretty smooth. I, uh, I felt like the opening went well. I got a comfortable position early on with black. And then, then the conversion, I, I think, was very smooth as well. So take a look. Um, it was a Nimzo Indian. Earlier in the tournament, I played a, a two knights tango against Rochelle Wu. I spent a good deal of time preparing this before the tournament. Um, but I decided not to use it in this game. I wanted to play something a bit more solid. So I played e6, knight c3, bishop to b4. Uh, Nimzo Indian... This is not the easiest opening to learn or study just because white has so many options and there's so many different ways like the position can transform. There's also so many ways that black can play um, in terms of like which pawns to move. Um, so it's a very flexible opening. And um, I mean, to play the Nimzo for either color, you have to basically learn um, like a whole a whole set of openings, not just one line. So that's why some people, like in this position, they avoid the Nimzo. They play like knight f3 or g3, which are uh, kind of the main alternatives. But uh, we went into this. He played e3, the so-called Rubenstein variation. This is probably the most common way to meet the Nimzo. And then I play b6. This is the first kind of new move for me. In the past, I've castled. And... Um, like I usually go for d5, but b6 has uh, has an interesting idea to it, and he played knight g2, which I uh, I was expecting. And the point of knight g2, it looks weird at first because it blocks in the bishop, but white simply wants to play a3, and then if I take knight takes and white avoids the uh, the double pawns on the queen side. Um, so I was expecting this, and I got to play uh, the line I prepared, bishop to a6 with the simple idea of hitting the pawn. Pawn's not defended. And white doesn't necessarily want to play b3 because that weakens the knight on c3. So white has a few options here. Uh, there, there's probably three main options. There's a3, probably most common move. There's also knight g3 and knight f4, um, also playable to defend with the bishop. He played knight g3 in the game. Um, just to show the main line, if he does play a3, I would take. Then after takes, I would play d5. And it's it's a solid variation for black. The idea is to try and trade off light squared bishops. Um, and if white plays b3, then like very simply castling, and it's a game. And white does have the bishop pair, but this bishop's locked in. So I was really just going for, for something solid. But uh, okay, knight g3 was played castling and now bishop to d3 so here i just follow through with kind of the main idea with bishop a6 i play pawn to d5 and we did trade takes 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 and then castling so so far this is all pretty standard play rook e8 this is probably the most flexible move um, i know i want to play rook e8 i wasn't sure if i wanted to like go for knight d7 or go for c5, knight c6. So just being flexible. Then he plays f3. So this is maybe um, like the first sign that like he's committing to some, some sort of kingside plans. Uh, there's a few ideas with this move. Uh, the main idea is to eventually play e4. Another idea is to play knight f5 and g4. The drawback of f3, though, and what happened in the game is that I can respond with c5. And this is very common for especially queen's pawn openings. Whenever white plays f3, c5 is very thematic. 
And the idea is it's very hard for white to play e4 because d4 is a bit loose. And actually for the rest of the game, like he never got e4 in. And the pawn just stayed on, on e3. So I have a feeling maybe f3 was, was a slight misjudgment. Of course he tried to like justify it in the game. Um, I was feeling a, maybe a, a slightly better approach for white would be a3. I kicked the bishop. I was planning to move d6 or f8. Let's say d6. Then I thought like b4 and like bishop b2, rook c1 and put some pressure on the c-file. Maybe even play pawn b5 at some point. Um, or even like knight b5, rook c1. And yeah, I thought white should maybe play a bit more positionally. So um, f3 was played, I play c5. And then he plays knight e2. After the game, I was interviewed by, by Lenderman and um, Lenderman was criticizing this, uh, this move, knight ce2. Um, he said it was moving the knight in the wrong direction, which is perhaps correct. Like the knight should probably stay on c3 and pressure d5. I play knight c6, a3. And now, uh, now important move, because I don't want to play bishop a5. So I want to keep the bishop like back on this diagonal. So first I play c4, hitting the queen. Queen c2, bishop d6. And uh, I was pretty content with the setup. It's still difficult for white to play e4. Like, e4 doesn't work now because uh, the center pawns come under fire. Just take on g3 and I'm winning d4 or e4 or both. So I play bishop d6, he plays knight f5, bishop f8. Then he moved back to c3. So maybe it was a slight waste of time. I play a6. And I was being patient here. Like I, I want to play b5 and um, maybe someday even b4 trade off and get the knight to d3. Uh, maybe also like b5 and then a5 and b4 and just storm with the pawns. Um, another idea with a6 is to play rook a7 and just bring this rook to the half open file, which uh, we do see a bit later. So he plays g4, uh, a slightly delayed grab, expanding on the, the king side, um, trying to support the knights. So it's clear that he was maybe trying to orchestrate some attack. And the idea of g5 is, uh, is slightly annoying because um, this knight would need to find a, a reasonable square. Um, but then I realized g5 isn't so annoying. Oh, the question from Dripman13. Do you think you lost a tempo by not just playing bishop f8 right away? Um, that's actually a good point to bring up. I was very well aware that after bishop d6, knight f5 hits a bishop. And I, I did this intentionally. Um, I knew I could play bishop f8 in one move. But I figured that with the knight on f5, white is also going to lose time. Because uh, I'll eventually play g6. And the knight will most likely be kicked back. Mm -hmm. So yeah, my bishop's content here. I have d ideas of g6 and uh, bishop g7. And I thought like overall the position is, is very like harmonious for black. Um, like still ideas of, of this queenside storm, still ideas of this. And I thought my king was, uh, was quite safe. So knight c3, a6, g4, b5. Just improving. Um, so I do allow g5. g5 was played. Some people are just really happy when they see g5. Um, <laughs> and then I play knight to h5. And the knight looks kind of awkward here because it's, it's completely restricted. Like it can't move to any of these squares. But at the same time, it's kind of an outpost. Like I'll play g6 and the knight's very stable. And this knight is also kind of stuck. And the g5 pawn is hit. So I figured this is uh, this is okay. So queen g2, and then g6, hitting the, the knight. And then the next move that was played, I, I kind of overlooked from white. I was expecting knight g, wait, what was I expecting? Knight g3, I just win the pawn. Maybe I was expecting knight h4, or knight h6. But I think, okay, my opponent played the best move, queen g4. 
making it so I can't really take the knight because my pawn structure is hideous. And then I played rook to a7. Um, so the line I want to show is I was considering some move. Okay, first of all, I can't play queen d7. This is a, a tragic blunder. Knight h6 wins my queen. But I was considering queen c8. And then I was like kind of dreaming about a line where white plays knight g3. I take the queen. He takes back. I take on g3. He takes back and he has triple g pawns. And then someday in the far off future, I'll play like this. He'll take. I'll play this. He'll play g5. Second g5. I'll play this. He'll take. And then he can play g5 once more. And I don't know why I was thinking about this during the game, but <laughs> I was just trying to figure out like the most number of times you can play pawn g5 in one game. Because um, 3 is a lot. <laughs> anyway, um, what happened in the game? I play rook a7. Uh, being patient, I figured that uh, why not make an improving move? This is maybe one of the one of the pieces which wasn't doing anything on on a8. Um, I someday still want to swing it over. So he plays knight g3, we trade, and then I play bishop to g7. It's feeling very comfortable here. Ideas of um, just improving. Like I, I figured my like all my pieces can find squares. Actually, in this position, I, I was beginning to imagine like my ideal setup, because there, there's a number of pieces which can still be improved, uh, mainly the bishop, the knight, the rook, and maybe the queen. So I was imagining bringing the knight to f5, having the bishop on g7, and having the rook on e7. And if I achieve the setup, then there's a lot of pressure on e3 and d4. And white will have a very hard time playing e4 still because d4 is uh, is attacked multiple times. So, I start with bishop g7. He plays king g2. So the one sort of trump that white has in the position is I have open h file. So there were like very clear ideas of just destroying me on h7. However, like even if white gets three moves in a row and wins h7. I just play king f8, and the king is actually still pretty safe. So it wasn't the biggest concern. I think there is more, more emphasis on the center. I play knight e7. I was pleased with this move, just idea of knight, uh, knight f5. He plays f4. I think f4 was a um, uh, just positional blunder. Um, it's not a great thing when you have a dark squared bishop and all your pawns are on dark squares. But when he played f5, there's actually like a very clear idea. Or uh, when he played f4, there's a clear idea that he wants to play queen f3. And then g4 and then f5. And then maybe even f6, maybe open the f-file. So if he gets a few moves, it can actually be annoying. Especially um, like once g4 and f5 is coming... Um, it's not the easiest thing to deal with. Okay, so I play knight f5, hitting the pawn. And now it's not so easy for white. He plays queen f3, hitting this pawn. And actually when I played knight f5, I, um, I had to calculate. So I had to calculate knight f5, queen f3, because I have to worry about d5. And I was calculating rook e7, knight takes d5. There's actually a really nice move in that line. So, uh, let me play this on the board. I play rook e7. And this will be a question for the chat. Because rook e7 does allow knight takes d5, hitting the rook, also defending the pawn. Uh, question is, black to move. What is the best move for black? How can black punish this, uh, this knight move? So the chat is still contemplating. A lot of people saying queen takes d5. This blunder is a queen, I think. Queen takes d5. I know you want to play knight takes e3, but there's bishop takes e3. Few people saying taking on e3. Taking on e3 doesn't work. If knight or rook takes e3, there's just knight takes. e3 is sufficiently defended. Okay, so congratulations to Alex Luong, Love Hey Chess, Tristan Soliri, and RAR2040. 
uh, finding the right move, and now combinatorial. Um, rook e4. It's a not like it's not the most forcing type of move. It's not a capture. It's not any sort of check, but it, it does make a threat. It obstructs the queen from defending the knight, and in doing so, um, I'm just threatening to take the knight. And remember, the knight is tied down to defending this pawn. And if I can win the e3 pawn, I'll win the d4 pawn. So the position can actually crumble really quickly here for white. Um, the knight has to move somewhere, it moves back to c3. I could even take with a rook here, I can take with knight or rook. Um, and then things just simplify in black's favor. Bishop takes, takes, I'm winning this guy on f1, and then I'll win d4. So I actually win a pawn in the end and just have a, a great position. Um, so I had to see that. I don't know if I had to see that, but I, I saw the idea of rook e4 when I played knight f5 ensuring that uh, that I can play rook e7 and, and white will be forced to be passive. So this is what happened. Um, he did not take on d5 because of rook e4, so he saw it too. Um, he plays knight d1. Knight d1, it, it looks so depressing, but um, it's the best attempt in the position, trying to just hold on. And like after he played it, I was feeling, I mean, I was feeling really good here, and then he played my d1, and then I realized, like, I, I still need a plan. Like, white's super solid here, and it still takes work to break through. And white actually has a clear plan here. White wants to eventually play g4, f5. Has to start with maybe like king g1 or rook h1, just to deal with knight h4. Um, so the ball is in my court, and the... The idea I came up with was um, was actually very satisfying, and it, it it transpired in the game, and I managed to I think I managed to to play the most accurate continuation. So I think what I'll do is I'll show the next move, and then I'll have the chat find the move after. Um, so I play queen d7, and white plays rook to h1. And I think this is like very critical position because like black black's pieces are fully optimized. And I, I need some like further idea. Also, white has this idea of g4, f5, later f6, maybe ideas of mating me. So I don't have like unlimited time. So again for the chat, black to move and find the best move. And honestly, this is a type of move, okay, you can guess, but it does require like calculation. It took me like several minutes to be fully confident that this is actually working. If you're watching on YouTube in the future and you want more time without any clues, feel free to pause the video. But let's see what's suggested. We have, okay, we have both options of taking on d4. We have uh, rook e4. We have knight d6. We have g5, which is slightly illegal. <laughs> Bishop e3, also illegal. <laughs> Hopefully there's more legal moves suggested than illegal moves. We have rook e2, also illegal. Resign. That's legal, but it's wrong. Okay, so there's a good handful of people that have found... Uh, found the move that I played. Um, and the, the move that I played, I actually wanted to play a move earlier. Uh, the move is bishop takes d4. And it's the type of move you can play just based on pure intuition, like after takes takes, you can see a beautiful knight, the rook's coming in. But it's also very forcing because I hit the queen and I follow up with more initiative. So just going back to this position, I really wanted to play bishop takes d4 here, but I was having a hard time evaluating like takes, 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 and then queen g4, and I thought the queen was active here. Um, I liked black's chances, but I thought it was getting a, a little bit murky. So this is why I played queen d7, um, just ensuring that when I do take on d4, white doesn't have access to the g4 square. 
And it's actually hard for white to to deal with this threat. He can't play queen g4, obviously, because knight takes e or knight takes e3. Maybe queen g4 could be playable, but it looks wrong. Um, but yeah, the main idea is to to control g4 and then sack on d4. So what ended up happening was uh, was really nice because the queen's attacked, and I continue like I, I think for the rest of the game. I continue just throwing punches, basically making threats like rook e2 on the horizon, knight b3 on the horizon. This queen is actually like almost trapped. Like the only squares for the queen are c3 and f1. So f2 runs into uh, to rook e2. So we play queen c3. And what else to do? Whoa, it's Chespra in the chat. Eric beating up on Canadians. Uh, I apologize, but not really. Um, but yeah, yeah, my opponent was Canadian, so I apologize if I made one of your compatriots slightly sad. But that's the nature of chess. I'm sure you'll get revenge someday. <laughs> or some Canadian will get revenge on me. I'm going to Canada in like a few months, so I guess I have to watch my back. <laughs> Um, okay, so queen c3. Trying to do something, hit the knight, get the queen safe. I play knight b3, hitting the rook, also kind of tickling the bishop, also preparing d4. And actually when I initially saw this line, I was calculating um, like d4, I thought the queen had to go to b5, and I was calculating a5, and the queen's actually just trapped. It's just being like hugged by my pawns. Um, but I missed actually that the queen could go back to f3. Um, but I missed it like a few moves in advance. So once we got this position, I realized d4. Um, it's still good for black, but there's there's actually a far better move here, at least in my opinion. Queen f5, hitting the rook, also trapping the rook. Like the rook's just trapped. There's no defense. Like white can't block. This a1 square is off limits. Rook e2 still looming. So I'm down a piece for two pawns, but I mean, just massive initiative. Um, lonely Pawn asking why not Rook e2. Yeah, Rook e2 is playable. I thought I could save it for later. Because um, Rook e2, Knight f2, and it helps the Knight develop, and it also makes White closer to connecting the Rooks. But I'm sure Rook e2 is, uh, is also winning. So queen f5, um, he plays knight f2. And then then I play rook e2. So I didn't take the rook. Because um, taking the rook, actually, it leads to messiness. Like knight g4, and then like he's threatening mating ideas. Knight h6, king f8, queen h8 would be mate. And I didn't want to calculate this. I would imagine black is still winning somehow. Maybe like rook rook e2 followed by d4 but um i decided to play rook e2 now uh just prevent any sort of counterplay uh the rook is still trapped this bishop can't move i mean white would like to connect the rooks but um bishop has no squares so he plays queen f6 um yeah this is kind of a last ditch effort uh the idea with queen f6 is actually interesting uh, I take on f2. Ah, maybe I should have had the chat find this. Um, actually, would this be a valid question? Let me just show this line. I wanted to take on b1, but there's a, a slightly tricky line, which I, I just didn't want to calculate, um, which is rook takes h7. And like now, I would think it's still winning for black, but... Like, I, I need to be mating the, the king or somehow forcing a queen trade because white is ready to mate me in multiple ways. And if I take, uh, this is, oh, this is not perpetual. Oh, I thought this was perpetual. This is winning for black. I forgot the queen defends g6. 
and my rook my rook uh, is defended on e8. So I could play king h8, check here. White has no more checks. Um, so yeah, even that trick didn't work. But this was a nice finish. Rook takes f2, takes, and then queen c2. And um, when I played queen c2, I, I saw the final mate. It's mate in like seven, I forget the exact number of moves. Somewhere in the range of like six to eight moves. King f1, queen d1, king g2, check, king to f3. Maybe this is a good moment for the, the chat. Um, yeah, let, let me give this as a final question to the chat. Black to move. Find, find the force mate. I mean, it looks really good. How should black proceed? Um, I'll give credit to finding the first move in the variation, but I'll give extra credit to finding the, the whole mating sequence. It should be mate in one, two, oh, it should just be mate in three. Um, yeah, very important in this position not to <laughs> blunder the queen. Because um, moves, I mean, a move like rook, for example, rook e6 might look fun, attack the king and the queen, but then there's rook takes d1. So uh, the best move is rook e1. Obstruct the rook from attacking the queen, attack the king. Uh, Andromeda said the line king f2, queen e2 mates, which uh, is correct. But John, John Davis said the line king g2, queen e2, king h3, and then rook takes h1 mates. He resigned like one move before. Like he resigned in this position. So it was a nice game. Um, I mean, in the final position, I'm down a rook for two pawns. Not that it matters. Um, but there are some nice sacrifices. Like the two sacrifices in this game were bishop takes d4 and then rook takes f2. Some forcing, forcing chess. And I think a, a nice theme in this game was the fact that I, I didn't really go for any attack straight away. I just was patient, like slowly improving the position, got my structure, got like every single piece where it wanted to go, and then then the tactics flowed nicely. Sometimes this is this is typical in chess where, like before you can actually launch an attack, you want to make sure your pieces are in good squares. And unfortunately for my opponent, like these, these pieces never got in the game. So after the game, we were saying that like maybe white should have been a bit more patient. Um, like even in this position, starting with bishop d2, rook e1, because white also had time to improve. So that was my game. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed that. If you want to do your own analysis, I'll leave the study link in the chat again. Uh, for the people watching on YouTube in the future, also hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, I'll be I'll be back with more videos. You can smash the subscribe button if you haven't already and click the bell. And yeah, I'll see you in the future.